up in there. Yeah. And then uh, in Gindy Greenberg, I'm going to take Greenberg. I'm also going to take Greenberg. All right, so here we go. Welcome to the quarterfinals of the Star City Games Open Series here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Gavin Verhey. I'm joined here with Adrian Sullivan. And you see two players on the screen who know each other well but are playing very different decks. On your right, Charles Gindy playing Esper Blade. It's very similar to the list that Jerry Thompson used to win, you know, and just have win last week and have total dominating success, or get second last week, and have total dominating success the past several weeks. Um, he's been a great player playing it. We've seen him play it earlier today, and he knows what he's doing with the deck. On your left is a di much different story. Harrison Greenberg, another Florida player. He's playing Jumanji, a deck with which first appeared in Edison, New Jersey at the Open Series there, and unlike a lot of the other players which jumped off of it, he's just been playing it and refining it in every Open, going X2 and X3 and working hard, and he finally broke through to make top eight. Jumanji is this green-white deck that uses Little War Elves, Fauna Shamans, uh, Venge Vines, Birds of Paradise, all kinds of uh, cool little accelerants, and then backs it up with Lead the Stampedes and card advantage engines, he believes this matchup is insane for him. He's, when we talked to him earlier, he said he would like to play against Cobblade all day long. Does, did you say that he ran Gideon in his build? Uh, I, I know they had Gideon back in Edison. I don't think they have it now, but I didn't see his entire main deck. I can't be sure. In the background, you can see very briefly Megan Holland, the MTGmom.com <laughs> fame. Edgar Flores also sitting there next to Charles Gindy. Uh, uh, Colossus Fuentes. Sorry, Colossus Fuentes, my bad, my bad. Colossus, <laughs> wow, that was a, it, it's I don't know cool. why I said that. It, it's cool, we all make mistakes. I was mistakes. talking to Sometimes, earlier, too, and I was like, hey, Colossus, and now I'm just like, Durr. It's okay, Edgar is, is in top of this event. Yes. Uh, so he's got, uh, he's got matches to win. Yeah, so it looks good. like uh, Charles Gindy is going to take a trip to Paris, but not the good kind, as he uh, mulligans here. And okay. I guess Harrison is keeping his seven. Having been to Paris, I'm not sure, you know, unless you're on a romantic getaway, and even then, if there is a good trip to Paris. Well, I've never been, so I guess I can't say, but... <laughs> it's, they're an interesting people, the Parisians. <laughs> okay, Charles Gindy. He looks just, like, happy to be, you know, that smile, happy to be here in a good top eight. Harrison, he's uh, almost half getting a Unabomber on here. <laughs> Hiding under that hoodie. Doesn't have well, we, a... We call that a Jace back in Seattle. <laughs> Is that the Jace? That's the Jace. Uh, uh, ironically, he has no Jaces, but isn't afraid to give Charles the stare down. And he, once again, it's great to see a player like Harrison Greenberg break through after just week after week of him coming up to us and telling us about his deck and how we, what changes he made this week. We had him in the booth earlier, and he said his major change this week was uh, adding Memora side to his sideboard. So creeping tar pit, and then a Birds of Paradise from Harrison. So he's got a swamp and three Memora sides. Not coming in in this matchup, but still okay. worth noting. We've got a preordained facing off versus a Bird of Paradise. Uh, and it looks like Charles is all lands except for one spell. Couldn't quite make it out. Yeah, he's got a Jace. The ubiquitous blue planeswalker. And Harrison's got a turn to Fauna Shaman, and that's the play. Ouch, but no land. Uh, Unless he's holding back. Nope, no land. Turn three. We see... Inquisition. Yep. Squadron Hawk, Linowar Elf, Squadron Hawk, Overwhelming Stampede, Baneslayer Angel, and a Vengevine. So go I'm. Go ahead. No, I. So I mean, the thing is, even with only one land, he can get that Fauna Shaman active next turn, play a Linowar War Elf, and then he can start doing some really insane things with, uh, with that Venge Vine. Like he can discard Venge Vine here, go get a Venge Vine, play a Linowar War Elf, and then just start doubling up on Venge Vines and serving pretty quickly. <laughs> these are the, these are the wrong deck lists. We were handed deck lists, but they were not the correct ones. So we're gonna have to hand these back. I was like, huh, this is very weird. This player's yeah. not in our feature, man. <laughs> uh, so let's see. So Harrison untaps it. Is he going to find a land? No, he does not. I think that was Molten Tail Mastercore he drew. Probably not what he was looking for. And he's wow, content to just, go. to just strip back. The thing here is he doesn't have to play that Linowar Elf. He can just hold it and then use it to return. Oh, he, Her Linowar Elf got discarded, so he especially can't play that Linowar Elf. But he could find a Shaman 4 one, but he's perfectly content just waiting and getting a Venge Vine, discarding that Venge Vine and then starting to go off with uh, the Fauna Shaman. 
Okay. <laughs> Jace. All right, well. Jace for the brainstorm. I see a, a, a Gideon in there, which is a rough one. I'm almost surprised that Charles didn't go minus one bounce Fondasham in there and just shut it off. Well, one of the things that might be of concern, right, is if there is a Vengevine, what might happen is a Vengevine would go to the yard, and then the Vengevine could come back by, like, mana creature, mana creature. Sure. But I mean, Charles knows Harrison's hand, thinks that Inquisition, so I, I think he knows he, Harrison would have had to have gone runner, runner, and chose to not cast. He only needs Lenora. one runner. He only needs, uh, he only needs to have drawn a, a one drop. Why? Because then he uh, searches for another one drop, and then it goes one drop, one drop. Sure. Well, no, not if the Fauna Shaman is bounced. I guess he, I mean, he doesn't get another... Uh, he doesn't. He would have to bank on drawing a one drop. I think you'd probably get benched yeah, yeah, in I'm that just situation. Yeah, it's not runner, runner. But it's yeah, yeah, it is possible, yeah. So he did draw a land here finally, so now he goes Verdant Catacombs, and I think we're likely to see Squadron Hawk here, followed by passing with Fauna Shaman up. I would say uh, probably likely to see Squadron Hawk in a one mana card, right? Uh, did he, what did he search he, he for? Searched for he searched for Vengevine. Okay. Or or did he get Birds of Paradise? I think Let's he might see. have gotten a bird. Yeah, I think he, I think he got birds. Squadron. So there's Squadron Hawk, but I don't know if he's ready to pull the trigger yet. He might just because that's only one Vengevine coming back, which granted will kill the Jace. I would be happy to kill the Jace and hit him for two. I mean, he's still got enough creatures in uh, in his hand that he can bring back the Vengevine afterwards just fine. Right. That's, that's totally fair. That's just, so he uh, Squadron Hawks up some some stuff, and now we're gonna see is he gonna pass or is he gonna throw down that birds. Looks like, yep, Bridge is, is coming out. Zing. And Vengevine serving at Gindy's that Jace. Gindy's going to take two, and Jace is going to die. Gindy set up his draws, but... Now, there is a Gideon in his hand. Okay, and there's the yeah, Day of Judgment. Day of Judgment, zing. Yep, and that's, I'm sure, what Harrison was worried about. No white sources? Is that Forest Forest? That is Forest Forest for Harrison Greenberg. There's nothing he could do. And go, and then an Inquisition comes back on the other side with Hawk, 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 and then things he can't get. It looks like the rest of his hand is Vengevine, Overwhelming Stampede, Bane Slayer, Angel, and Moltel Massacre. Yeah. Let's see. Things look rough for, her, for Harrison now. Oh, there's a white source, I think. Is that Stirring Wildwood? Yeah, Stirring yeah. Wildwood. Oh, my. And there's a go for the throat drawn for Gindy. It's going to be excellent for him. Natalie could go for the throat. No fifth land yet, it looks like. Yeah, so Charles also uh, bottlenecked on mana. But if Harrison has a lot of cards he can draw to bring back that Venge Vine, start doing some damage, granted, go for the throat will send it right back to the bin, but that still forces Gindy to use his go for the throat. All right, so Sun Petal Grove, and there's a Venge Vine. A great way to start off this thread, even if it gets mana leaked, he can just follow it up the next turn and bring back two Venge Vines. Yeah. So even though Harrison took a beating there with that Day of Judgment, he's still very much in this game. <laughs> Again, he has to decide, is it worth taking it? Do I mana leak it? What's going on? And Guinea is deep in the tank. All right. He lets Venge on resolve, takes four. He doesn't. He figures if I'm spend a card on it now, it's just going to come back next turn. And he's going to bring it back anyway. I'd rather just uh, go for the throw it when it attacks next turn after he brings it back. Squadron Hawk setting up the uh, army of chumps yep. to hold off the Vengevine for when uh, a Gideon might come down soon enough. Yeah, chain of blockers for Charles Gindy. And so next turn, Harrison can return both of his Vengevines if he wants, or return one of his Vengevines if he wants, attacks with both of them. Blo one of them gets blocked. Oh, Charles Gindy pulled out a Stoneforge Mystic on accident. Thankfully uh, he didn't keep it out. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, Harrison pointed it out, and Gindy shuffled it back into the deck. Uh... Good catch by Harrison Greenberg. Uh, let's see. So it looks like he's going to keep up Mana Leak slash go for the throat. Or play out another Squadron Hawk to block with. Yep, he just keeps Sits up. Back. Keeps it up. And passes. Harrison. Oh, no. No casting nothing. 
He's like... Here comes the go for the throw for that land, though, I'm sure. Yep, yeah, land goes down. And he's going to block that thing with Hawk. And now, that, that go for the throat on the land is actually brutal, because now Harrison doesn't... Uh, can't go double Hawk. Granted, he drew birds this turn, so he can still return Vengevine. Okay, Gindy has a preordain. And considering the two cards, I couldn't quite make out what they are. I mean, he'd just be happy to find some mana at this point. There it is. And there's the land he's looking for, so now he can maybe start to get that Gideon online, maybe he can start to get uh, that Sword of Feast and Famine online. Serves him for 1-1 with Squadron Hawk. <coughs> and Gideon's sitting at 10 life, but I think he's in an okay position. All right. Goes in with all the claws. Caw, caw, caw. Does not look like land to me the way he drew that. It is a land. Oh, it is a, it's a stirring wild. But it does not look like an untapped land might be. Yep. So he plays oh, there. Oh, he's got uh, and just his plays own out hawk. Of, plays out he's got hawk. a bird back so that he can uh, he can double cast if he wants to with That's the right. birds and squadron hawk. He's going to see if Gindy gets greedy here with those uh, squadron hawks to potentially serve <laughs> with that Vengevine out of the graveyard next turn. But he also has stirring wildwood, which uh, can serve in two. Based on his previous play with the String Wildwood, I'm a little surprised he didn't uh, play out the birds also, but... Sword eats a bird. Tapped out. Six life. That is not much. Not much at all. Let's see. It looks like Harrison drew a Linoir Elf. And he's going to play... an Elf. And now he's going to play a Squadron Hawk. Bring back that Vengevine. And so now there are two Vengevines coming into the red zone for Harrison Greenberg. Now recall um, Charles Giddy playing the three-color version. It's very possible he only has that one Day of Judgment main. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure that's probably why Harrison went for it, because they got to see each other's deck list, and he was like, well, if he has the one day, he has the one day. And he had it. Okay, so Charles Giddy drops to two life. But Gideon Jura... Plus Mana Leak backup? Is that what I'm going to see? Gideon oh, comes into play tapped. Okay, so he can't have the Mana Leak backup. Right. But there's nothing wrong with just dropping a Gideon. At two life, I'm okay with uh, with that against a deck that can't burn my face. Right. And uh, if they've seen deck list, then I, I don't think Harrison has any Gideons in his deck, so Charles should know that and not have to worry about it. And that, that Squadron Hawk can block one of those two Vengevines. Oh, wow. Okay, so yeah, he's just... Coming in for the unblockable. And okay. then that gets him to untap everything. So that's basically now a... he can have Gideon plus Mana Leak. Or Gideon plus re-equipped to <coughs> a, a Squadron Hawk if he wants. It's basically just a free five points of damage. So yeah, why not take it? The only cost is that you lose the the sword off your bird, which doesn't really matter that much. So he plays Gideon. Gideon. Yep. I'm going to go plus Attack two. Attack him, please. And let's see. Question, does the re-equip happen? Yeah. Looks like he wants the pro green. Yeah, I think that's important. He's going to want to block one of those two Vengevines. And Harrison goes to his draw step. I think he drew another land here. Looks like that's either Vernon Catacombs. Yep, Vernon Catacombs. Here comes something else. Another Vengevine? Molten Tail Master. Molten Tail Master so, so no burn to the face, huh? <laughs> 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 apparently. Apparently not. Uh, apparently he has the Master Core to clean things up. So if Harrison gets to untap, he instantly wins. Interesting how he chose to play the Molten Tail Master Core pre-combat. So Vengevine goes down. And now he can play that Birds of Paradise if he wants to bring that Vengevine back. But I think since he's got the game on lock with that Master Core anyway, it's better to, to just pass. Yeah, so you can regenerate it. I mean, you probably crack the, the land now so you don't get foiled by Doomblade or something in response to double Doomblade or something silly like that. Although I don't think Charles has any Doomblades. But you just want to keep up regeneration mana. And then if you untap, you win the game. All right, so... Can Charles defeat Harrison Greenberg this turn? 
He certainly doesn't have an answer to it in his hand. His hand is double Manly Squadron Hawk. Now remember, this game, Harrison Greenberg stumbled on mana. He had only one land to Charles Gindy's three. And he still came back, even after Day of Judgment, wiped out everything, leaving him with just a single land in play. Or sorry, a second land in play. Yeah, just two lands. And both of them were forests. And, I mean, Harrison said this matchup was a matchup he wanted to play all day, and I can see why. This <laughs> yeah, is, look this, at his smile. <laughs> th this, is, this is a pretty bad draw for Harrison. A pretty weak draw for Harrison, at least. And he's still about to win the game. Even without that mass score, Gindy was still in a pretty poor position. I mean, he certainly could have come back from it, but it certainly wasn't where he wanted to be either. Comes in here for a grand total of six. Discards to the Mastercor, Dis untaps all of his land, and now he just has to kind of hope that, uh, that Harrison Greenberg doesn't know what his cards do. We'll Which uh, I don't think Harrison Greenberg is going to, to make that mistake. T Discards the Mastercore. He knows what part of the card does. <laughs> He did not raise his draw step. Deal four to you, Andy yeah, Charles Gindy backs him right in. Right. Harrison Greenberg up a game. Yeah. After stumbling early on, that's really impressive. Wow. Very cool. That was actually hand. He he handily took out that deck. He just and he, his draw did not seem great. It, it didn't a, even seem good. He he did nothing for like three turns after he got Day of Judgment, in, you know, and he still climbed right back in the game. Granted, Gindy stumbled on mana a little bit. So, you know, like, he couldn't cast Gideon on turn five, but, I, you know, considering Harrison's situation, I don't think that's much you can complain about. Uh, Gideon Mulligan to six. M Gideon Mulligan, Mulligan to five? Okay, so Gideon Mulligan to five, which certainly was rough for him, too, but... I mean, he had his hand full of cards very much through that, like, I think uh, Squadron Hawk hit on turn four? No, turn five. Turn five? Well... Okay, so for those of you who have been watching all day, then you've been knowing that we've had a Star City Games Premium giveaway. Three months of free Star City Games Premium if you can answer a trivia question. And remember to put your response to pound SCG Premium. Yeah, don't, the important thing is don't tweet it at us. I mean, you can if you want. You can go tweeting at SCG Live, but the hashtag is the most important thing. Make sure to have pound sign SCG Premium in your tweet somewhere. Could be anywhere. Could be in between like two A's, like bookends. It doesn't matter. Right. Put it in there somewhere. And the trivia question for this quarterfinal is going to be, there are numerous blue-white based decks in the top eight. David Sharfman is playing a blue-white based deck. It is not Cobblade. Name the, um, I'm going to say two artifacts, sorry, let's just make it one artifact. Name the proliferate artifact that he has that other people are not playing when it comes to this matchup, or this, this type of uh, color combination. Blue-white cob Cobblade is what other people are running. He is not blue-white Cobblade. I think it's Th Throne of Geth, right? Could be Throne of Geth. Yeah. Could be Throne of Geth. Pretty sure it's Throne of Geth. So, we'll, uh, yeah, so tweet it at us on SCG Live, uh, and we're, tweet at us at SCG Live, put it in your hashtag SCG Premium, and you could have the opportunity, if you answer this question correct, to win three months of free premium. Once again, the question is, what proliferating artifact does David Sharfman have in his deck that really separates his deck from a lot of other blue-white decks out there? So let us know. Tweet at us, and you could win three months of premium. Where you're going to be able to read return reports from Jerry Thompson, Brian Kibler, Patrick Chapin, Mike Flores, all kinds of great players. So, definitely check it out. My uh, my friend Candace says that it's not Inferno Titan. It is, it is not Inferno Titan. Yeah, she doesn't play. Well, she's she's <laughs> correct. It is not Inferno Titan. I'll give you guys that that much of a hint. But I wouldn't be surprised if they give Inferno Titan pro proliferate. If it was whenever it attack proliferate, that card would be pretty awesome. Uh. All right, so going into game two here, Harrison Greenberg took took down the first game. Uh, granted, Gindy Mulligan down. Uh, he's got stuck on four lands, but Harrison, you know, got his entire board day of judgment away. 
he only had two lands in play, neither of which could cast any spells, but he came back pretty handily. Harrison believes this is his best matchup. He's like, Cobblade is the deck I want to play against all day long. And uh, he's played against it several times today and beat it. So maybe he'll take it down again, but Charles Gindy certainly is going to aim to take it back. He, uh, he's played a lot of uh, tight magic today, and Esper Blade is a deck that he can play very well. He's had a lot of su success in the past with control decks, taking a U.S. Nationals finals with a five-color control deck back in 2009. Um, I got a word from Glenn Jones. Our uh, intrepid reporter says that John Winters with Rug versus uh, David Sharfman, Rug wins game one. All right, so Rug won the first game against David Sharfman's deck. Uh, we've loved Sharfman's deck, and we know this is a close matchup. We know Lotus Cobra, Cobra is a pivotal card, so we'll see what happens. Meanwhile, back to the game at hand, Harrison Greenberg starts with Leyland of Sanctity in play, and that is a card that you might not board in against this deck most of the time. You're like, why would we drive board in these ley lines? But Harrison was talking to us, and he's like, this card is awesome against Esper Blade. It stops all their Inquisitions. <laughs> right. It stops their Gideon Jura plus two ability. And it just it stops all the cards that beat you. It doesn't stop a ton of cards, but those are the cards I'm most worried about. Harrison draws a uh, second ley line on the first turn. I'm sure not his favorite card to draw there, but it uh, perhaps replaces a card that might have gotten Inquisition otherwise. And I, I think I see an Inquisition in Charles's hand that it's not doing anything. So flash, flash freeze. freeze on the bird. Yep. Does he have a follow-up mana? He does. So it looks like Harrison boarded in some controlly cards in this matchup. He's got a Journey to Nowhere in his deck as well to uh, deal with the Ka and a Stoneforge Mystic. This looks like both to the bottom. Yep, sends them both south, draws a new one. And I think you're right, I'm pretty sure that that's at least one Inquisition. I, I saw a go for the throat in Gideon's hand for sure, but I thought I also saw I thought, another I black spell. right behind it. I, I'm not 100% sure though. Was that another Ley Line? I, oh no, is Harrison drawn two Ley Lines? One of the dangers of running a card like Ley Line, if you are, don't have a good way to get rid of it, yeah. is that that can just rot in your hand. Charles keeps two cards on top, one of which is a Swamp, the other, of, I believe, is a Day of Judgment, which is going to be a, very strong for him. Um, Harrison brought in all four Leylands, I would imagine. Maybe the right play is only to bring in two or three so you I don't have like this problem. Two or three. Uh, and I'm going to see a counterspell here for this Lotus Cobra, I bet. Let's see what uh, Gindy decides to do. He can only counter one spell right now, so it could be a bait and a follow-up. Nope, just a natural, here's my card. Yep, there's Flash Freeze on uh, Lotus Cobra. And all right, so now Guinea starts hawking, and Harrison doesn't have anything going on. Yeah, he started with that ley line in play, but he has no action at all. Yeah, I would not be surprised if Charles Guinea just starts being the aggressor here. Yeah, I mean, uh, those squadron rocks are going to do some damage, and even without a sword equipped to them, without anything on Harrison's side of the board. Squadron Hawk can really crack through for some points. As anyone that has played against fairies knows, flying 1-1s one add up. <laughs> it's true. All those spell setter sprite hits deal a lot of damage over time. And here we have another uh, another 2-drop. Yep, there's Fauna Shaman. This is a, a real threat here if it's not answered incredibly quickly. There is a go for the throw from Charles's hand. It's a card that can take over a game. And yeah. I think we're going to see that go for the throw. Yep, there it is. And, yep, so go for the throat on uh, on that Fauna Shaman. Takes care of that problem. Yeah, uh, Fauna Shaman just starts getting Venge Vines and makes it really rough for uh, Gindi. But, uh, I mean, I talked in my article this week, it goes up on Monday, about how if you untap with Lotus Cobra or Venge Vine, you almost always win, it feels like. And you just have to kill those cards right away. And... No exception here, as Charles immediately points go for the throw at Fauna Shaman. Doesn't even think twice. And so, yeah, Charles definitely has one Inquisition in his hand. So the Leyland's shutting off Inquisition, but I don't know how much it matters. All right, yeah, Charles is pecking away. The birds are here. <laughs> pecking away. He's, Nicely said. Yeah, Nicely said. He's doing it Hitchcock style. Gideon, maybe? One, uh, two, three, four. That's Jace. Uh, no. no. <laughs> just, here they come. That here. is... Caw, caw, caw. That is squadron clock mana. <laughs> In comes Forrest. Wait, he's, 
you can't march flats for a forest. Silly Greenberg. Alright, so he gets a swamp instead. And so he boarded in the swamp. I wonder if he boarded in Memora side too. Um, I feel like maybe he's boarded in Suva, you have another land. But. Maybe he did bring in more. So I don't know. I just can't see I it. I just can't see that one. What do we got there? Is that a journey to nowhere? I, is that a black card in his hand? Is that Memora side? He did bring in Memora side. Wow. What do you name here? Sword of Feast and Famine. And on the other side, we have Inquisition, Glare, Glare. Uh, uh, day of Judgment and Condemn. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I already, the day was already in his hand, and yeah, the condemn, I could see it. So, I, I, I don't think you have to name the sword here. That's the card that's probably going to provide the biggest clock. Or maybe he named Gideon? Gideon. Okay. Yep, Gideon. Those are interesting. So, he still named Gideon, even though he has his ley line in play. I don't know. I feel like even without the swords... Even without the swords... That clock from the Squadron Hawks is just going to do so much damage that if he gets Gideon out, I don't think it's going to matter that much because the four, basically a 4-4 four, four flyer every turn for 1-1 for one, one flyers. I don't think I see... There's no stirring Wildwoods in play, right? No. Yeah, so uh, this is a, a four-turn clock. Yeah, it, it seems like Harrison muddled his deck in his sideboarding. He brought in Journey to Nowhere, he brought in more sides, he brought in... Um, Lay little, little of Sanctity, and it's, I think if you just stay aggressive, you can really keep an edge here. But by boarding all these reactive cards, it clogged his hand up, and he just hasn't been able to do anything at all this game. Yeah, I mean, Leyline of Sanctity in this matchup is not the same thing as Leyline of the Void against Dredge. <laughs> it's true. Uh, so, there's a Birds of Paradise, and there's the Journey to Nowhere. <laughs> Journey to Nowhere. Journey to Nowhere turns for this from a three-turn clock into a four-turn clock. It still feels pretty, uh, pretty sad to have used your journey on a single squadron hawk. Yeah, it does not feel good. And there's Stone Forge Mystic. Oh, ouch. Getting sword. Yeah, I think Harrison has to fix his, his deck for the third game. Uh, I'm, you know, as far as sideboarding goes. I think maybe he's starting to realize it too. Like he looks at his down at his hand. He's got two ley lines. Looks on the battlefield. There's nothing, and I don't know. I know he's been sideboarding against Cobblade all day and winning, but is that another journey? Yeah, uh, yeah. He just packs yeah. it in. He draws a second journey. He just knows. Tim, I don't think I even like the Memora side. No, honestly, I, I, don't, I just I don't, want to kill the guy. Yeah, I mean, I could see boarding in the swamps. So you have another land if you want to do that, but and I, I don't know. Even I even don't know about boarding all the four ley lines, but. I don't know. I mean, Harrison has played this matchup a ton. He feels like it's a really good matchup. The, the danger, of course, is when you have a really good matchup, you just win so much that no matter how you sideboard, it's like, well, I sideboard like this because I keep winning. But it's those games where you get draws like those where you draw all your reactive cards right. that, that it really, really hurts like, you. What we might be doing, for example, is you might have a winning matchup, right? And then you have a 75%, for the sake of argument, a 75% matchup. And then you board and you still win, and you don't realize you made yourself have a 65% game, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's, I, uh, I, yeah, we see Harrison going back to his sideboard here, too. I think he's, yeah, he's <coughs> taking out several cards here. Especially he's going to be on the play this game. He wants to have the aggressive advantage. Um. I mean, the way I imagine this, right? Despite the fact that you can get some real value out of Inquisitions being turned off, I would have one ley line and leave it at that. If it's there, it's there. If it's not, it's not. And in the far, far late game, it can turn off again. Right. I mean, I can see bringing in two, but the full four, like, I think you'd run into problems like that. Even three is just, you know, problematic. Yeah, I mean, you have... So Michael Jacob had this awesome rule in a deck building article. He wrote for a lo uh, another game a long time ago, and I, I love this. It's if you... If you have four cards in your deck, you have to you have to either like you have to draw that card every game, or you have to be okay with drawing three copies of that card in your opening hand. And like, if you were in all four laylands, you open with two. It's like you mulligan to five, basically. If you even if you start with one and play, it's already like you mulligan to six. And the leyland only gives you like some amount of you know some amount of value in the first place. You know, it only stops like you know seven cards in Gindy's deck tops. So while good. I don't know that I would want the full boat. I think you just want to keep your deck as uh, robust against the control decks as possible. But we'll see what Greenberg does. He's obviously switching it up. I think he figured out his uh, folly 
and uh, he'll be changing around his plan for the third game. Uh, Gindy, on the other hand, still shuffling. Seems mostly content with what he's doing. He's not taking nearly as long to sideboard as uh, Greenberg is. Uh, and game one, Greenberg looked in a good position. Game two, he did not at all. So we'll see what happens. For those of you just joining us, I'm Gavin Verhey. I'm here with Adrian Sullivan. We're going to game three of a pretty tense quarterfinals match between two great players. On your right, we have Charles Gindy. Charles is playing Esper Blade, pretty stockless as far as Esper Blade decks go, close to what Jerry Thompson's been using. Just a great player piloting it. You play the deck well, you do good with it. Uh, on the other hand, Harrison Greenberg, a player who's been grinding out these tournaments, playing the same deck for the past month and a half. He's played the, uh, picked up the Jumanji deck in Edison, and has just been playing it every week since then, slowly making changes to his deck. And now he's found himself here, filing the finals after a bunch of X2 finishes. So, we'll see uh, if he finally breaks through past the quarterfinals. He granted he hasn't made top eight yet. Opens but with a stirring Wildwood. Yep, and there's the Inquisition of Kozilek. And there's the Inquisition. Looks like his hand is Moltail Masticor, Journey to Nowhere, Lotus Cobra. So he did leave the journeys in. Oh, goodbye to the Cobra. And, and that is a slow hand. Yeah, now Harrison just has nothing going on. I mean, he has stirring Wildwood, I guess, but Harrison has to draw some action here. It's going to be a big problem. I'm, I expect, unless Gindy's hand is... Uh, not good, or Harrison rip, rip, rips. I, I think Gindy's going to take this one. I think Gindy definitely has the advantage. Let's see. Oh, another journey. Once again, all those reactive cards. What does he want to be journeying here? I I don't know. I like You can theoretically journey a Stoneforge Mystic on turn two, which is okay, but I think you just want to be as proactive as possible. I don't know. I'd, I'd be curious to talk to Harrison. We've ha it's funny, we've had him in the booth a couple of times, and he tells us how good this matchup is, but we've never asked him how he sideboards. And I think it'd be cool if we, uh, we could ask him potentially. I don't know if maybe right after the match is the best time to catch him, but <clears throat> I am curious why he sideboarded this way and how it's been working for him in other matchups. So it looks like he, looks like he drew Birds of Paradise there. Down comes a birdie. Mm, that leaves him with a lot of journeys. Yeah, still two journeys. <laughs> I mean, it's got more journey than karaoke bar at midnight. Wow. Zing. Uh, there's Seachrome Coast. I see a condemn there in Charles' hand. And, uh, I mean, that Molten Tail Masticor might be okay, but... I mean, he's got to attack with it, and, yeah, and Charles has that condemn. I think it's, it's condemned. Man, Charles' hand looks unbelievable right now. It's got Gideon, Flash Freeze, all the cards you really want in this matchup. And he uh, tutors up another squadron hawk. Starting the, uh, the perpetual chain of hawks. 520 players? We're down to these eight. Yeah. And soon we'll be down to just four. And the quarterfinals are being played out right now, and then the semifinals will be played out tomorrow morning, bright and early at 8 a.m., so make sure to set your alarms and come join us. After that, we'll immediately be starting in on the legacy portion. Get the Masticore. A, yep, and there's the Masticore, but I don't think Harrison's going to be able to just sit back, so I think it'll probably eat a Condemn next turn. Yeah, I mean, between Hawks, that Condemn, you know, there's just, that Masticore actually doesn't represent much of a threat. There's only one creature in the yard. Right. I mean, it's possible that Heron could, Harrison could have some ridiculous uh, foresight and uh, oh. and there's Inquisition. Is that going to whiff or is it going to get something? It's, journey, uh, journey. And, and lose a squadron, oh, hawk, which is what hawk. he really needed. I, I think wow. I actually would have cast that hawk, I think, before casting that Master Core. Then you could play Master Core next turn with, with your generation up. Yeah. That's the plan. I think, he, I think he might have wanted to try and get it under Mana Leak if he thought Charles left those in. Uh, I'm not convinced that oh, Charles did. almost, but. almost. Almost forgot. Whew, that was a close one. Yep, there's a, there's a reminder. <laughs> and yeah. So now, I think if Harrison... Okay, so Harrison chooses to not attack. He, he, so he's just going to sit back. He's, he's got eight damage in the yard. He thinks my plan is to burn him. He thinks his plan is to burn him out, which is reasonable. He's got a bird of paradise, which represents four more damage. That's 12 damage he's got available. 
That's a lot of damage. And Carl Charles Gindy has go for the throats in his deck. Aren't going to kill a Mastercore. Day of Judgment will not kill a Mastercore. He has to trick Harrison into attacking somehow to condemn. But Harrison obviously knows what's going on. He knows that's how a way he can lose. And he feels like he has to ride this Mastercore. Wow. Block sets up a shield. Yeah. And oh. and Gindy uses Tectonic Edge. All right, so now he's going to discard a card to that uh, Molten Tail Master Core. MTG Mom back there, Megan Holland. Discards Benjvine. And uh, now it's the play, just pass and burn him out. Now the go for the throat on that Burn of Paradise actually is really potentially significant. Yeah, losing that string Wildwood could be huge. Let's see. Stoneforge Mystic, man, Gideon's hand is still pretty stacked. Stoneforge Mystic sitting there, and he still, he still has Gideon too, plus Flash Freeze. All right, yep. Mystic. There's a Mystic grabbing Feast and Famine. Yep. Um, and so, I think you, you just gotta shoot him. Did you just go for it? Yep. Shoot you, he says. Drops Charles Gideon down to 16. All right, four more activations. So if Harrison draws enough creatures to discard that Master Core, that's a four-turn clock. Now remember, that Sword of Feast and Famine can actually make the Master Core die. Right, because he'll be forced to discard cards. Harrison really needs a Squadron Hawk. Losing it to that Inquisition was really rough for him. Okay, Harrison passes back. Yeah, it's true, the... Uh, the sword is a pretty good answer. Granted, like Harrison could choose to shoot the sworded creature instead, but that still forces him to spend all of his mana just killing one creature every turn, which I'm sure Charles Gindy is probably fine with. <coughs> now Gindy is sitting on a Gideon, so he can make that Massacre attack eventually. And condemn, condemn that Massacre right out. In for two. Right. Another hawk. There's a hawk. Go he just ahead. passes. Take four. All right. Pitches Lotus Cobra to uh, the uh, Exiles Lotus Cobra, rather, to the Master Core. Oh, oh, wow. No. Kills a hawk. Kills a hawk. Does this mean he's going to start attacking? Oof. That discards Little War Elf. I mean, maybe he thinks he has to attack now, but if he does that... He, wow, that's stirring Wildwood. I just, if he had that stirring Wildwood in play, I'd feel much more comfortable about his position. Yeah, losing that Wildwood is rough. So he ships over the uh, sword. And now Gindy's going to attack. Does Harrison shoot the, yep. Shoots that. Now he's just so in on his Master Core. Let's see, he's got a Lotus Cobra and a Vengevine and a Squadron Hawk as creatures in his graveyard? Or is that a journey? I think it's a Squadron Hawk. So yeah, I think he... Look, <laughs> it's too much, too much text to be anything else. So, a land. Yep, so he's got three things he can exile, but he really doesn't want to get rid of that Vengevine. Passes back. No, I think that might be a journey, actually. So uh, yeah, he might only have one thing he really wants to exile in his graveyard. Keeping Gindy's creatures under control is surprisingly effective. But I mean, it's... He's forced to, to right. do it. I mean, Gindy's happy to have this sequence of plays happen. Right. It, it's, just, it's just a black hole. Gindy still hasn't been able to find that land for Gideon, but he finally got it, and now he'd be able to uh, make Harrison attack and condemn that Master Corps away. Oh, oh, Doctor. He even took the dice off his deck, too. Rough. So Masticore down, and here comes Squad, which, and that's the card he needed too with the Masticore. Oh, duh. wow! Two hawks left in the deck. Yeah, wow. Ouch. He lost the Masticore, and he and he drew the card, of course, that would have been best to draw with the Masticore. Yeah. Rough, very rough for Harrison Greenberg. Oh, he's not completely out of this game, but he's going to have to climb back into it, and it's not going to be easy. 
So here comes, here comes the hawk. Second hawk, which brings back the Vengevine. Yep, it's the Vengevine. Vengevine comes on in. Serves right into the red zone. Condemn going to be uh, saying goodbye to it. Yep, and the Vengevine goes away. Harrison gets three life. And here we tarp it. Yep, there it comes in play. So we're going to see a tap out here. For Gideon. Charles Gindy with Gideon. Yeah, and there's Gindian. Gideon. Gindian. Gindian. Oh, I like it. Gindian. I like it. Charles Gindian. Uh, Harrison draws. He's still sitting with a journey in his hand. I think that's stirring Wildwood he just drew. Serves for uh, What happened to the birds of what did he attack with that birds of paradise? What just went on? Oh yeah, I do with this Gideon. That's right. It's off screen right now. We're gonna get it pushed back on screen. Gindy. There we go. Getting that Gideon back on screen for us here. And there's creeping tarpet. Equips it. Attacks. And discards the uh, Vernon catacombs. Oh man. Yeah, Harrison Greenberg said this was his best matchup, but. He said some subpar draws, and Gindy's played this matchup pretty well. You know, I I have to wonder if he shifted the tone of his deck too far. Yeah, I mean, it could have been what did it. We'll get him. In, I think we'll get him in the booth afterwards, just make it, if he's in the mood, see if he wants to tell us about his uh, sideboarding choices. Let's see. Whips sword to hawk, and he just passes back. Draws string wild, picks there it up. They are. That's yeah. it. Charles Gindy takes the match. Two to one over Harrison Greenberg. Harrison thought the matchup was great for him, but that's not how it turned out. Charles uh, advances to the semifinals, poised to make another great finish in an SCG Open. And uh, we'll see if we can get another match on camera for you potentially. We'll find out what's still going on out there. Let's see.